Flight of a Witch by Ellis Peters, dramatised by Sally Hedges, with Ewan Thomas as Tom Fels and Rob Spendlove as Detective Inspector George Fels. Flight of a Witch. The Hallow Mount. There are some places that attract evil. that have an atmosphere of ancient wrongdoing, of a malevolence, that seems to seep out of the earth and infect the very air we breathe. An idea which my dear brother George would have dismissed with contempt. The world's a rational place, Tom. That's what police work's taught me. Apply the rules and everything slots into place, like a jigsaw. It's just a question of finding the right pieces. And being myself a mathematician, I was, for the greater part of my pig-headed youth, inclined to agree with him. Until... Oh, heaven help us. Listen to this. In the 17th century, the superstitions of the past were largely due to poor education and the ignorance of the lower classes. Ignorance spelt with an S. Terence Wiggins, lower fourth. <laughs> right in one. <laughs> Haven't come across that one yet. Mm, you will. Until the time when I found myself in a remote town in the Welsh borderlands in the early autumn of 1966, the newest member of staff at Commerborn Grammar School for Boys. Insufferable snob to boot. You should know, Godfrey. How are you settling in, by the way? Oh, fine, thanks. In the process of looking for a more permanent abode at the moment. Probably end up as a policeman. What? What are you talking about? Terence Wiggins, right little Nazi. Somehow it didn't seem the right moment to mention the existence of my detective inspector brother stationed with the Birmingham police. You should try Fairford. It's where I am. A blissful two miles away from this madhouse. Any connections in the area, have you? Um, no. Well... Try the old forge. I've heard Arthur Beck's looking for a lodger. Beck? What's he like? Oh, middle-aged, retired schoolmaster. At pains to appear eccentric, you know the sort? Oh, don't I just? No, definitely not the moment to mention George. Trust me, brother mine, there's not one unsolved crime to block my copybook, and do you know why? Because I always follow the rule, look at the facts, and trust the facts, Tom. And then you'll find the truth staring at you, right in the eye. And I suppose to be fair, I should warn you, Beck's got a daughter. Really? Yes. Uncommon handsome. Eighteen years old. And by the name of Annette. Annette? <laughs> no, no. Annette. Old form, 16th, 17th century-ish. Oh, really? Yes. Died out quickly, though. Most of them got burnt. What are you talking about? Witches. Annette, Janet, that sort of thing. Right name for her, if you ask me. And brought up as George and I were in the prosaic, materialistic world of our very respectable, hard-working parents, and with similar outlooks on life. Look at all this malarkey of the newspapers just now. Woman meets spirits in out-of-body experience while on operating table. I ask you. It was small wonder I was unprepared for what hit me in this strange, far-flung place on the very boundary between commonsensical England and the mystical Celtic land of Wales, as though astride a line between two worlds. What am I to tell the priest? that my girl Tabitha says she were only gone a morning when everyone knows it were a full sun night. Oh, they'll burn me at the stake for a witch if I tell them that. I were lost, Mother. Oh. I tell thee, I were lost. I don't remember what happened. For a whole week on the Hollow Mount. <laughs> oh, what did the earth open up and swallow thee? It is true, Mother. All I can hear in my head's chanting strange words. Oh, it is the devil's work, my girl. It's very peaceful, Mother. Oh, Tabitha, thou art not the same. Where's my daughter gone? Thou art the look of someone dreaming of. Oh, Tabitha, uh, uh, Tabitha, answer me! Yes? Can 
I help you? I'm calling because I, I, I was told there was a vacancy here. Oh, it's about the room. Come in. There is a kind of beauty that produces crass wolf whistles and another kind that creates silence, taking the voice out of men's mouths and the breath out of their throats. Ah, uh, who was it at the door, Annette? This gentleman, Father. I'm uh, so sorry to disturb you. I've just joined the staff at Commerborn Grammar. Ah, Tom Fels, new maths teacher. Yes. Arthur Beck. Yes, we've heard about you. <laughs> and I heard you had a room to let. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll gladly show you. Uh, you've met my daughter, Annette. And uh, this is Peter Blacklock, a friend of the family. Hello. Uh, how do you do? Uh, I was just on my way out, in fact. Ah, oh, well, uh, thanks for dropping Anne at home. And I'm glad the rehearsal went well. Oh, it did. Helped in no small measure by Anne. <laughs> uh, Peter is the choir master up at St Mary's Church. Ah, I see. And you're in the choir, Annette? Yes, I see. She's that. one of the altos. An invaluable one. Yes. Uh, for some reason, sopranos are tearing a penny round here, Mr. Phelps. Quite. And when one's attempting something as ambitious as the Messiah. Uh, but uh, I really must be off. Uh, of course. And good luck with it. Uh, good night. Goodbye. I'll see you out. Uh, the room is this way, my good fellow. Uh, and it works for the black locks up at the hall. Uh, Mrs. B is our local lady of the manor. <laughs> you know the type. Rolling in it and up to her neck in charity work. And it's lucky to work for her. They take very good care of her, you see, Mr. Fels. Never let her come home alone. Always send her in the car. Though today the chauffeur's off duty, I suppose. <laughs> now, here's the room. I accepted it on the spot. Would you like a lift? Well, that's very kind of you, Mrs. Uh... <laughs> Malandine. Miles' is dear mother. But don't worry. I promise not to ask you how he's getting on. <laughs> it's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you mind if I call you Tom? After all, you're almost in loco parentis to my brat. What brings you out this way? I've just been on a quest for suitable lodgings. Oh, and, and like all true knights, found your desire? You could say that. From your direction, I divine you've just come from the Becks. Am I right? <laughs> well... <laughs> oh, we're a very close-knit community round here. What do you make of them? Very pleasant. And you saw uh, Annet, I presume? Yes. A father's very careful of her. I noticed. <laughs> Though he's not so mad as he seems, considering the way she looks. <laughs> very um, unusual, yes. Extraordinary, even. Not only in looks. There was an incident last spring. She was discovered, with my blessed offspring, at Comerborn Station. Apparently, they were about to run off together. Bill, my husband, he discovered them there quite by chance. Cases packed, on the very point of boarding the train. What a shock. Oh, absolutely. For everybody concerned. He just grabbed them, delivered Annette back to her father, then shut himself in the living room with Miles. Didn't get much out of him, I understand. I kept out of it. Made a cheese souffle. Seemed the most sensible thing to do. And is he still... I mean, has he got over it yet? I don't know. Getting over Annette might be quite a lengthy convalescence, don't you think? It well might. Still, he's trying for Cambridge next year, so that'll keep him busy. Oh, I hear he's going camping with you next weekend. Plus, sir, uh, 30 juniors? Heaven help you. <laughs> We're only going a couple of miles from the school. We'll survive. Oh, drop me along here by the travel agents, would you? Mm. I've got to see about some maps I ordered. Uh, listen, um, you won't take them on the Hallow Mount, will you? The Hallow Mount? Why not? I, I don't worry too much myself, but some of the mothers might. You weren't thinking of going there, were you? Well, no, I wasn't. Too exposed for October. <sighs> I was thinking of just taking them along the Westland Valley. Oh, good. Fine. There's your gin and tonic. So, do you think the head will expel Graham Meredith? Mm, it's highly likely. Mr Jones doesn't normally take such drastic action. But Graham has had three disciplinary warnings already. And besides, there is a body of complaints from the parents. Mm, talking of complaining parents. Oh, not Mrs Morgan again. Oh, David's in your class, isn't he? Yes. Uh, rather, no. I wasn't thinking of Mrs. Morgan. It was Mrs. Mallandine. <laughs> Miles's mother? I've always found her very pleasant. No, she wasn't complaining. 
It was just that she gave me a lift from the bed. Oh, yes. You're not the first young master she's picked up. What? <laughs> she's, um, a little bit flighty. Really? <laughs> well, I don't think she had any interest in me. At least I wasn't aware. So? She just made a rather curious comment about the Hallow Mound. Oh? Is there some incident I should know about? No, not at all. It's just that the place has several spooky stories attached to it. Not recent incidents. They're legends and myths from long ago. Like what? Goodness, I can't remember. I've never taken any notice of them. Godfrey's the person to ask. Uh, no, thanks. I don't think I'll bother. <laughs> Already had enough of him, have you? I can't help but notice how the staff room empties when he comes in. <laughs> <laughs> It's really damp down here in the valley, sir. Couldn't we have camped higher up? Well, I would have taken you up into the hills, but I was warned off it. You what? Well, the Hallow Mount, anyway. Who by? Your own mother, as it happens. Mm, probably a sensible move. On what grounds? Well, all this region is a bit... It's a bit weird, really. In what way? Oh, it's got a long history of strange happenings. Some say a witch's coven used to meet on the Hallow Mount. <laughs> And maybe still does. And then there's the altar. Have you seen that? No. From the top of the Hallow Man? Oh, there's like a spine that stretches out down to the valley like it's some beast. Lying in wait there, breathing in time to the rising and sinking of the moon. Y yeah, all right, Dominic. It's just that near the top there's an outcrop of rock, which looks exactly like... An altar. And some say the druids used it for human sacrifice. Look, Dominic... You're not scaring me, but the younger ones might be listening. And if you walk there at nightfall, it's said you might never be seen again, for people have been known to disappear! Ah! Cut it out! <laughs> <laughs> but why should anyone be afraid of it in this day and age? Oh, we're not afraid. Are we, Miles? Of course we're not. In awe of it, then. Oh. In awe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, in awe. That's it. But that's quite another thing, isn't it? Is it? Ah, Mr. Fels. Annette. You're going home to London for the half-term holiday? Yes. How did you know? Oh, my father probably mentioned it. Is that you, Annette? I'm just going out, Father. Well, your tea's nearly ready. I'll be back. Excuse me. Could I just get my raincoat? Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> It's pouring outside, did you know? Yes. I like the rain. How long will it take you to drive home? About four or five hours. Well, you've got another hour or so before the light fades. Yes, yes. It would be a good idea to... Um... Goodbye, then. Bye. See you on Tuesday. <laughs> and she went off up the lane. A few minutes later, I set off towards Comerborn. As I drove, I glanced up towards the long, rain-dimmed hogback of the Hallow Mount. And just as the clouds parted and a quivering spear of light transfixed it, I was sure it was Annette I saw climbing the hillside and vanishing over the crest. Inside the hill. Oh, oh. Oh, it is the most 
beautiful place. There are tiny lights. They dance in the air like drops of rain that don't fall, and they make me want to dance. <laughs> I like the rain. You should dance the breeze. Oh, I've been to the adults. And there'll be no physic to cure that. No. It is the truth thou art speaking, Tabitha. Tabitha, didst dance! What's wrong with dancing? No. If I say I were dancing, then I'll be hanged, will I? Or worse, then I don't know. I don't know what happened to me. All I know is, I was happy there. Is it a sin to be happy? I returned to Fairford quite late on the Tuesday evening. As soon as the door opened, I knew something was wrong. Ah. 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 There you are, Phyllis. Uh, nice weekend. Yes, very thanks. How about you? Oh, uh, very quiet. You can get quite lonely here. You know, I've missed you. <laughs> You're not on your own, are you? Is Annette working late at the hall? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, she's uh, gone to Comerborn with her friend Myra. <laughs> there was some film they wanted to see. Uh, one of these uh, three-hour epics. I was slightly perturbed by Beck's strange edginess, and as I opened the cupboard to hang up my coat, something struck me. It's a warm evening. Uh, very, very close. Did she go out in her raincoat, then? What? Her usual jacket. It's hanging right here, but her raincoat's not. She didn't wear her heavy raincoat on a warm evening like this, did she? What? There's something not quite right here. It was raining on Thursday when I left, but it hasn't rained again all weekend. The roads were bone dry all the way. She isn't out with Myra, is she? What do you mean? I said she isn't out with Myra. What's happened? She never came home. Since? Since last Thursday. Have you told the police she's missing? No, no. You see, something like this happened. She tried to go off once before. And now again, people will say that they'll call her. I didn't want that. No more scandal. Not if I could avoid it. Have you looked for her? Yes. Oh, yes. What about Mrs Blacklock? Hasn't she been wondering where her secretary's got to? Virginia's been away all weekend at some conference in Gloucester. She gave Annette the whole week off. If Annette came back now, no one would know. No one but us two. But it's five days! And no message, no letter, nothing. No, nothing. I saw her. Last Thursday, when I left. As I was driving past the Hallow Mount, I saw her climbing the hill. I saw her go over the crest and disappear. Then we ought to go there. What? If that's the last place we know she was, there may be some clue. Yes. If there's anything to be found after five days. She was about here. I'm climbing this way. Fast. As I walked, a curl of wind spiralled upward in front of my feet, along the path Annette must have taken, bending the grass stem, leading me on. See. Slow down, old chap. At the summit, there was a strong wind blowing from the west. A rock stood out against the skyline, sharp and hypnotically black. I realised at once, this must be the altar. The wind drummed in my ears, and in its depth, there was a strange sound as though I could hear... Annette! My God! What's the matter? We came to look for you. Where have you been? When you went out, you say you've been for tea. I know I'm late. I went farther than I realised. Annette! Please! Aren't you supposed to be in London, Mr. Fells? Annette, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Why... Why are you both here? Can't I go for a walk for a couple of hours without you following me? A couple of hours? What about the five days in between? What five days? And that was as much as we got out of her. 
She recited it over and over again, the same story. This evening, I left the house and went for a long walk over the Hallow Mount. I meant to come back round by the main road, but it got dark so quickly I changed my mind and climbed back over the top. It was Thursday when I left, and so it must be Thursday now. Look, look at the date on today's newspaper. It's Tuesday. Five days have passed. Look! She couldn't be shaken from her story, and when we finally disbanded and wearily went to bed, I straight away fell into a fitful sleep. I'm not true. No. What are you saying? It can't have been five nights I was awake. Here you may have a little history, old boy, seeing as you're new to the area. Some say witches come and used to meet on the Hallowland, and some say people walking there at nightfall have been known to disappear. Tis not witchcraft. <laughs> Dost thou think I am a witch? Harriet! <laughs> Harriet! Harriet! I'd woken with a start, shaking from head to foot. Dear heaven. I lay tossing and turning until dawn, when daylight thankfully brought with it the return of my old philosophy. The world is a sane and logical place, isn't it, George? By Jove, I wonder what you'd make of all this. So, let's look at the facts. She disappears for five days. Alone? Why should she go to all that trouble just to be on her own? No, there must be someone else involved. And whoever it is must be human, for heaven's sake. And since sleep was impossible, I decided to investigate the last place we'd seen her, for any tracks, any clues at all. In the grey first light of day, the hollow mount lay slumbering, desolate. And then the idea came to me that in the depths of the wind sound, I could hear voices, as though I was not alone. Now, come on. Don't start imagining things. Let's be rational about this. I surveyed the lie of the land to see if there were any obvious escape routes. And that's the most obvious one down there, at the foot of the hill. And, allowing myself only one glance back over my shoulder, I set off. Yes. That's the track that leads back to the road to Abbot's Bale. And from there to, well, to wherever she or they liked. Yes. I had to face the fact sooner or later. They, it most certainly had to be. Now, what can we see? I couldn't get a car along here. Blast! But that fall turned out to be fortunate. With my eyes at ground level, I could clearly see a single broad indentation in the grass. There was no mistaking the recent marks of motorbike tyres. It was only a possibility that it was connected, but if it was, then whoever she had been with owned or had the use of a motorbike. And I knew Mars Malandine fell into that category. You wanted to see me, sir? Yes. I won't keep you long. Sit down. You own a motorbike, don't you? Yes, sir. May I ask, did you use it this weekend? Yes. I went camping up on Cap El Curig with, with Dominic. The whole weekend? When did you set off? Oh, about uh, half past five on Thursday. And when did you get back? We went for the whole half term. Got back about uh, eight o'clock Tuesday night. Uh, last night. Did you take your bike out earlier on Thursday afternoon? Say, round the track at the foot of the Hallow Mount? No, sir. Sir, can I ask, has this got anything to do with Annette Beck? Why do you assume it might? Well, her father rang my mother on Thursday evening, which was unusual in itself. But apparently he was fishing to know where I was. We concluded she might have gone missing again and, and he thought I might be involved. Anyway, if she has, it's got nothing to do with me. I, I'd just like to make that clear. If this matter is about Annette, and I'm not saying it is, but... You do realise you're bound to be the prime suspect? What? Considering that first time? When you were discovered together on Commerborn Station, I mean? Oh, 
No, no way. I, I don't want anything to do with that girl ever again. Believe me. Why should I, Miles? She's a very attractive girl. Oh, maybe, but not to me. Look, I... You might find this hard to swallow, but after that first time, I got some pretty strange... I don't know, warnings, if you like. No, I wouldn't go near her again. What sort of warnings? Messages, by post. They were all about keeping away from her. And one of them had... Look, you can laugh if you like, but... Uh, no, go on. Well, one of them had this weird symbol of some kind. And it was painted in... Well, it, it looked like paint, but when I examined it closer, I, I could swear it was blood. I see. How very disturbing. Yeah. Were these messages signed? No. I don't know who sent them. I, 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 don't, I don't want to know. They've stopped now and I don't want anything more to do with it. I see. You didn't think to go to the police? I thought it was safer not to. I don't suppose you kept any of these messages, did you? No. I got rid of them. Look, I don't want anyone to... Can this be kept just between us two? You mean you didn't tell anyone? No. Not even your mother? No, it would have frightened her. All right, Miles. Thank you. You can go now. Sir. And don't worry. Thanks. In the books I read now, I found a wonderful thought by a priest who wrote, We unconsciously act as angels for each other. The odd comment overheard on the bus can sometimes be meant for us. Alas for me, I didn't recognise the warning I now believe was in the words Miles spoke that day. I decided to think about the symbol he had described and to delve into some local history. Tea or coffee? Hmm? Which would you like? The kettle's just boiled. Right. <laughs> Tom? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, coffee, please. Black one sugar, isn't it? Yes. Jane, do you know anything of Tabitha Blount? Tabitha Blount? Hmm, the name's familiar. She has some connection with the Hallow Mount. Godfrey muttered something about people disappearing. I should have asked him more, but I couldn't spare yet another hour for one of his expositions. <laughs> <laughs> Quite. Actually, I do remember something about this, because James Roberts in 5A painted rather a stunning picture of a young girl by this so-called altar on the Hallow Mount. It was in the pre-Raphaelite style. I've just been looking her name up in this little book I borrowed from the library, about Celtic sacred places, but there's no mention of her. Mm, I'm trying to remember. Why do you want to know? Oh, just local interest. Not another car journey with Eve Mallandine, by any chance? No. <laughs> Some of the boys were talking about local stories when I took them camping. Oh, I remember. She was a young girl who lived around here at the start of the 18th century. She vanished whilst walking up the Hallow Mount, but turned up several days later, believing she'd only been gone for a couple of hours. Did she have no idea what had happened to her? Oh, I don't think so. I've always dismissed that sort of stuff. Oh, you can't take it seriously. Tom! No, no, of course not. But I'd like to find out the rest of the story, if there is anything else. Who could I ask? I could talk to James Roberts. He probably knows. He must have researched his painting. I could ask him. Oh, perhaps better not. Word might spread that you had a rather weird interest in the supernatural. It's easy for me, as I set him the painting project. I'll do your dirty work, but it'll cost you. Dinner? <laughs> now that makes my homework worthwhile. Annet. Annet. I want you to know that if there's anything I can do to help you, I will. I'd like to think you'd ask me. I don't need any help. I hope you won't, Annet. But I'm afraid you may. I feel it isn't over. And I don't want you to be hurt. Why should I be, Tom? Oh, I, I don't know, but I just sense... Annet, there's someone here who wishes to speak to you. Good heavens. George. Evening, Tom. This isn't a social call, I'm afraid. Are you Miss Annette Beck? Yes. Yes, she is. Miss Beck, my name is Detective Inspector Fels, and there's a matter on which I'm obliged to ask you some questions. What about? Wh whatever for. Uh, we, we, we'd better go into the living room, shall we? Uh, 
Tom, do you know the inspector? We're brothers. In fact, I may need a statement from you too, Tom. Of course. Well then, uh, what's this about, Inspector? Now, Annette, I want you to tell me how you spent last weekend. I can't do that. I think you can. I can tell you what I told them, but you won't believe me. Try me. I had five free days from Thursday. Mrs Blacklock was going to a conference in Gloucester. I usually go to choir practice on Friday evening, but... Uh, he rang up on Friday night, uh, Peter Blacklock. Uh, I mean, after choir practice. Uh, he was worried because she didn't turn up. I, I told him she had a bit of a cold and had gone to bed early. He, he rang again on Sunday morning after church to ask how she was. Uh, he's the choir So master, you weren't at choir practice on Friday evening. Where were you, Annette? I was home all Thursday afternoon. I remember I went out for a walk. And she told her story over again, just as she told us the night before. So you went up the Hallow Mount and vanished out of time and place. It's happened before, in the 17th century. Tabitha Blount. Good God, yes. Tabitha Blount. Mr <laughs> Fels, you must allow for the possibility of more things in heaven and earth, you know. How can we presume... Tell me, no Annette, everything? you were no nearer the underworld than, say, Birmingham, were you? No! Birmingham? What's all this about? Why, why should she be in Last Birmingham? Last Saturday night, around shop closing time, a young girl was seen by two witnesses standing on the corner of an almost deserted street in Birmingham. She seemed to be waiting for somebody, about 40 yards from a small but very exclusive jeweller's shop. Both witnesses gave excellent descriptions and... Annette fits them perfectly. What? However good the descriptions were, why a girl from Fairford, of all places... The girl had a Birmingham? small piece of paper in her hand and she was talking to a young man who seems to have taken something of a fancy to her. He saw her throw the paper down and he remembered it stuck in a rut in the pavement. We retrieved it. It turned out to be a tenpenny bus ticket between Commerborne and Fairford. With that and the accurate description, it wasn't hard to pinpoint Annette as the girl. Unfortunately, no one saw the person she was waiting for. But this is ridiculous. Why, why are you hunting for this girl? Because at made... around midnight that night, a policeman on his beat noticed the steel mesh gate over the jewellish doorway wasn't quite closed. He went in and found the till cleared of cash and about £2,000 worth of jewellery missing. The proprietor, Jacob Worrell, an old gentleman was in his workroom at the back. His head had been battered in with a heavy silver candlestick. He was dead. Oh. And I was just in time to catch her as she fainted. Yes, of course. Let's put her on the couch, Tom. No, don't put a pillow under her head. Keep her flat. Was taken inside. What? Hello. She's saying. Not alive. Lost. I cannot find. What? What can't you find, Annette? Shh. Uh, Think I am a witch. Uh, Detective Inspector Fels is here. He told me to ask you to hurry. Oh, uh, good. Thank you. Right, Annette. She's on her way. Annette. How is she? No, she sunk back. Is she subject to fainting fits? No. You frightened her. She could have read the story in the paper. We don't get newspapers in this house. Sensational rubbish. Oh, Annette. Annette. I think we'd better get her to bed. Yes. As I lifted her, her head rolled limply on my shoulder and revealed a thread of black velvet ribbon round her neck. George carefully eased it round till he could untie it. He held it up. It was a narrow circlet of gold. A wedding ring. How, how is she, Doctor? Physically, she's as strong as a horse. There are no ill effects. Perhaps it would be best to leave her alone for tonight, though. Of course. Do one more thing for me, would you, Doctor? With your permission, Mr Beck, I want to put a constable on guard here in your house. Uh, yes, yes. And I'd be obliged, Doctor, if you'd stay here with Annette until he arrives. I am on call. Oh, very well. I'll go back to her. But I hope your constable won't be too long. I'll be off now, then. I shall have to take this ring with me. Do you understand? Yes, yes, take it. Don't let her out of the house, and she must speak to no one but us. You'd better telephone Mrs Blacklock in the morning and say Annette is still unwell. Yes, that would be best. Now, I'll need a good recent picture of her. Ah, uh, yes. I uh, have one in my wallet here. All right, thank you. You'll have it back. 
And if you'll excuse me, I'd like to go back to Annette. I'll see you out. I can hardly believe this. I'm actually in one of your investigations. Why didn't you let me know you were coming? Oh, very unprofessional. Besides, I didn't want to give Miss Beck any prior warning. You don't really suspect her, do you? I suspect everybody, she'll have good reason not to. We're rather short on suspects for the boyfriend. She's led such a protected life. Anything more you can tell me, Tom? No. Except... Well, there is one thing. I went over the Hallow Mount yesterday morning early to see if there were any signs of a vehicle having been up there recently. I found tracks of a motorbike. It's possible someone might have brought her back that way the night before. There may still be a trace left. I could show you if you liked. First thing tomorrow. About seven, suit you? George, why the police guard? Where would she run to? I wasn't thinking so much of Annette running. This companion of hers has killed once already. He'll know we're investigating. And only Annette knows who he is. Come and join me, Tom. I don't usually indulge, but in the circumstances... I desperately wanted to sit quietly and think over the events of the day. I just don't understand this. But I felt I'd better humour him. So he was obviously in a bad way. How could Annette know a young man in Birmingham? It's a mistake, isn't it? He droned on, constantly needing reassurance. What'd she do for, for but he wouldn't be comforted until it started to become difficult to find the right words to say. But then why should I be expected to succeed with her? You don't know, Tom, do you, about Annette? I've never told anybody. It was ironic. I was only half listening when he made his startling revelation. I want to tell you. It's been on my mind so long. I've got to tell someone. She isn't mine, you see. Oh. I know it's hard to believe, but I never understood her. I was always ashamed and afraid, because she isn't even mine. I never had any influence over her. It's true, you know. My wife told me. She waited long enough for me to give her a child. In the end, she got one where she could. She never told me who. And then she died, when Annette was only three. One of those strange accidents that happen. A Annette had run into the garden one evening, when there was a storm. She was always fascinated by lightning. And my wife ran after her. I found her lying under that tree at the end. The one with the scorch mark down one side. Lightning, they said. One day she was there. And the next... My mind started working. Was it possible? Yes, it made a lot of sense. I finally got him to bed and then spent another wretched night. I never had any influence, 
any power over her. I awoke, my head pounding. These strange dreams, what did they mean? I felt as though the full weight of misery was pressing down. The misery of knowing there was nothing I could do to help Annet, except search for the truth, which I naively thought would help. So I arose the next morning early, and showed the motorbike imprints to George at the foot of the Hallow Mount. He took detailed notes, but what he made of it he didn't let on. On the way back, we stopped at the local petrol station. Ever met the lad who works here? No. He's a real flash Harry. Had just about every girl in the place running after him. Morning, Jeff. Oh, well, if it isn't Mr. Fels. Fill her up, lad, will you? Still driving for the Lowthers, are you? What's it to you? Oh, just like to keep up with the news. And I'm right, aren't I, in thinking you own a 350 motorbike? Look, what's all this about? I'm clean, I'm going straight like I said I would, OK? I'll take that as a yes. Right, that'll do, thanks. Oh, one last thing. Do you know this girl? What? Yeah, of course. Everyone knows who she is. How well do you know her? Been out on a date with her, have you? Well, has anything happened to her? No, no, just making a few inquiries. So you do know her? One of your regulars, is she, Jeff? Don't tell me she's a member of the Jeff Westcott fan club, too. Look, just lay off, will you? I might have spoken to her once or twice, but... Well, if you're looking for someone she's been seen with on a regular basis, why don't you try asking him over there? He nodded across the street to a young man in a leather jacket who had just propped a heavy motorcycle at the side of the road. He had the look of a gypsy, tall and dark. Who is he? Don't you know him? Well, perhaps you don't recognise him out of uniform. He's more often behind the wheel of a Bentley than on one of those BSAs. Must be off duty. The Bentley? Are you telling me that that's Mrs Blacklock's chauffeur? That's right. Since when? There used to be a thin grey-haired fellow named Brady. He retired about three months ago. And then he came. George looked at me with an amused twinkle in his eye. Right. Thanks, Jeff. Keep the change. So that's the reliable human machine that takes Annette home regularly. Don't think Beck knows. Probably not. Seeing as the chauffeur would naturally stay in the car when they reach the house. Hmm. Right. Where shall I drop you off? At the school, if you don't mind. Time's moving on and I've got house assembly this morning. What's your up? Now, let me think. Annette gets escorted home every evening by Stockwood, the dashing chauffeur. Rarely goes out except to choir practice. And it... That's it! I knew I'd seen him before somewhere. Who? The youth you've just been speaking to at the garage. Jeff, what's his name? Westcott. Yes, him. I saw him the Friday before the half term when she disappeared. Outside the church, just as Annette was coming out. I happened to be on my way to the Red Lion for a drink. Yes, I remember thinking she looked strangely nervous when she was talking to him. Look, I can't, so don't ask me. I was too far off to catch everything they were saying. But Jeff Westcott was looking very tense, I remember. It's not a good idea to be seen here. I wanted to step in and ask her if she was all right. But then Jeff turned, and he obviously saw someone coming out of the church, because he ran off. Was he bothering you, Anna? Oh, Peter. No. No. It's all right, he was just... Hello there. How did the practice go? Ah, oh, Mr. Fells. It went very well, thanks. That boy took off like a bat out of hell. I think you gave him a fright appearing out of the shadows like that. <laughs> yes, these uh, black cassocks have their uses. I've noticed they make you virtually invisible at night. <laughs> Great effect. I'm going for a drink. Would you both care to join me? Uh, well, uh, I... No, uh, thank you. Uh, I promised Mr. Beck I'd walk Anne at home straight after choir practice. So Westcott does know her? Yes, pretty well it would seem. Right, thanks Tom. Fancy a drink tonight? Fine. I'm working late, till quarter to seven. I'll pick you up from school, then. Mr. Fells? Mr. Fells? <sighs> Tom, have you got time for a quick cup of tea? I've got some news for you. Really? Tabitha Blount. Remember? We turned into the staff room, which fortunately was empty and sat in the far corner. The room was very warm and very stuffy, and I hoped my interest in Jane's information was sufficient to keep me awake. Curiously, Tabitha Blount was seeming less important, since Annette's disappearance was more likely to be explained by a liaison in Birmingham than a mystic experience inside a mountain. 
And yet, I seem to want to believe Annette's story, although it contradicted logic and common sense. So I decided to corner Dominic. Dominic? Miles's friend? Tommy, are you listening? I've just said, James Roberts told me he got his idea from Dominic. Apparently he's always trying to scare the boys with his witchcraft stories. Pretends to have inside knowledge and claims there's a coven that meets on the mount. Really? What else? <laughs> oh, Tom, you're completely hooked on this, aren't you? No, of course not. I'm just curious. Well, I had a good excuse to talk to Dominic, as he was the prefect in charge of my house activities for the Christmas fair. He was rather suspicious at first, but I think he finally believed that I wanted to set an assignment on local legends. And then he wanted to be impressive, feel important. Does he think there's still a practising coven up there? He seemed to. He was rather cagey. <laughs> Probably thinks I want to join. I'll be a laughing stock in the school. Thoughts of Jeff Westcott receded as Jane told me the conversation, and I began to feel uneasy. The room, too, started to get chilly as the fire flickered. No, it wasn't my imagination, for as Jane spoke, she pulled her cardigan round her shoulders. In the 18th century, it seems that... A sort of ritual took place at the altar on the Hallow Mount, with the participants encircling it. He said there were certain signs marked on the ground as well as on the altar, and the high priests chanted to invoke the devil. Sometimes there was a sacrifice. Human? Well, I hope he meant animal, but I didn't want to inquire too far. At a climactic moment, a rock would move on the mountain and reveal a path inside. This, it seems, is what happened to Tabitha. What? She went inside and disappeared. When she re-emerged, several days later, rumour spread quickly that she was a witch and the local priest came to exorcise her. She talked about how she had danced, which was thought of as sinful in those days. And she'd seen lots of lights inside and heard voices. Her personality had changed and it was said that a demon had taken possession of her soul and that one day... The real Tabitha would return. I shuddered, remembering my dreams. I had never thought myself susceptible to psychic phenomena. What was happening to me? It seemed as though I was under a spell. This was ridiculous. I had to get back to facts. Hard facts. Where did Dominic get this tale from? He wouldn't be specific. Just said all of the village children round here knew. It was folklore. Do you believe him? I do know that some of the older boys were found to be holding seances last term. Dominic was one, and Graham Meredith another. I told you about the disciplinary warnings. The third boy, Tim Pierce, left of his own accord. Apparently, they used to meet up with some local teenagers from Comerborn and frighten themselves with incantations. I'm thinking about it, it probably was copying the ritual that Tabitha Blount described. Again, that uneasy feeling... But I had to ask the question. Who were the local teenagers? Did he say? He only named one. And he became very frightened as soon as he'd said it. Annette Beck. At that moment, Godfrey came into the staff room. And I think he drew his own conclusions as he switched on the light and saw us sitting in the corner. Jane looked at me with a conspiratorial smile. I'd watch out if I were you. She picked up her books and said good night. I hurried to my waiting pupils, trying to put Jane's information out of my mind. But one thought kept asserting itself. Something I had forgotten. The ring. Was this a normal token of commitment to another person? Or was it a pact with the devil? Was she one of his brides? Whilst the five boys laboured over the maths I had set them, I remembered I had to meet George after I finished the lesson. It wasn't a difficult decision not to tell him what I had just heard. After all, it was probably only the imagination of a schoolboy, embellishing a tale which my sceptical brother would certainly dismiss. That's what I told myself. But deep down I knew my unsettled feeling had more to do with Annette and my irrational need to protect her. George was on the dot outside at 6.45, and we went to the Red Lion. The one and only pub in Fairford, did you know? I just wondered who we might bump into. 
but there was no sign of Jeff Westcott that evening. We had a couple of drinks, and then as George was dropping me back at the old forge... Thanks. I'll see you. What's luck you're doing outside? Sir! The chief just rung through. He's been trying to locate you all evening. I'll get back to him. What are you doing out here? Annette wanted a breath of fresh air and asked if she could have a walk in the garden. I didn't think there was any arms. You're so... not paid to think. Get her back inside, quick. Sir. Felsy, sir. I see. Where? What time? Right, I'm on my way. Trouble? A body's been found on the top, would you believe, of the Hallow Mount. Who? Have they identified Not yet. I'm going out there now. Where's that girl? Lock her! Yes, sir, she's here. Right, stay inside, both of you. Be seeing you, Tom. It wasn't until the next day that I was able to catch up on the latest developments. I rang George at his office, only to be told of the appalling news of the second murder. Last night, a body was found on the altar by a hillwalker. There was a symbol daubed on the side of the rock. It was obviously some kind of a ritualistic killing. But who was it? It was Jeff Westcott. The shock when I realised we'd only been speaking to Jeff that very morning took all the words from my mouth. And for the rest of the day, I was filled with a dread of what it could all mean. There was a symbol daubed on the side of the rock. It was some kind of ritualistic killing. It wasn't until much later when I read the account of the murder in the evening paper and saw a sketch of this grisly sign that I became aware of something niggling at the back of my mind. I got some pretty strange warnings, if you like, and one of them had this weird symbol. Slowly, the full force of the realisation dawned upon me. I'm afraid Myers will be back for another 20 minutes or so. Would you like some tea while you wait? There's some in the pot. Lovely, thanks. It was just I had a couple of things I wanted to ask him. He's one of the few people who've had any real contact with Annette uh, uh, and... L l let me stop you, Tom. Because I know you're referring to when they were caught at Comabon Station. And I think you ought to know it didn't happen. Not quite as I told you, anyway. Everyone thinks they're running away together, but... Uh, Miles never tried to go anywhere. With or without Annette Beck. But they were picked up at the station. With two cases and two tickets to London. Yes, two cases... But both of them were Annette's. Both of them? But your husband would have known, surely. Oh, my husband. Bill doesn't know his own shirts. I could filch a tie out of his drawer and give it him for his birthday and he wouldn't know. Why didn't Mars explain and clear himself? I don't know. I never asked. When Bill discovered them and jumped to conclusions, Miles said nothing to enlighten him. Nor did Annette. At first I thought Miles had bought the case specially for the jaunt. But I started to unpack it and discovered they were all Annette's clothes inside. I, I just didn't understand what was going on. Did you confront Miles? No. He seemed cut off. Very uncommunicative about the whole thing. I didn't want to come over as a prying mother, so I kept it to myself. I see. So only Miles and you knew that he was covering up for whoever she was running off with. Eve, do you realise what this might mean? I'm just beginning to. If it wasn't Miles that time, it, could it be? Yes. It could, couldn't it? It could be the same person. And anything Miles knows, anything, may be vital. Anything she may have said to him, a name, or anyone he saw her with. Oh, I... Hi, Mum. Oh, here he is. Oh, hello, sir. Miles, I just dropped in to have a word with you, as a matter of fact. It won't take long. Uh, I, I leave you to talk. I must put this letter in the post anyway. Thanks. Have you seen the evening paper, Miles? No. Well, you may have already heard, but a body's been found up on the Hallow Mount. Oh, God. Who was it? A youth by the name of Jeff Westcott. Did you know him? Uh, vaguely. He used to hang about with a crowd from the east side of the village. What I've come about is... I'd like you to have a look at the report in this evening's paper. It's the same, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Once Miles had got over the dread of talking about the whole subject, our conclusions were seriously unnerving. It was like the sign was a kind of signature. There was no name, just... just this at the bottom. Yes. If it was as you say, then it could represent either an organisation or just one individual. And if it's the latter, it's likely... I know what you're going to say. If it's one individual, then, then the person who sent those messages to me is... The... 
Oh, my God. But we've got to face it, Miles. If they are the same, then he's the same person who killed Jeff Westcott. And I think the only thing to do now is to go to the police and tell them what, what? you know. Oh, God. It said in those letters, if, if I did that, if I went to the police, some, something would happen. Something... Yes, but this is serious now, Miles. You can't just let it go. You've got to speak to them. You must. So, I thought Miles had better speak to you himself. I'm sorry, this looks rather like a deputation. Not at all. Now, Miles. Look, you won't believe this. Miles, we agreed. Yeah, I know, but he won't. I'm probably his number one suspect. No, you're not. We've already checked what you were doing at the weekend, and you're clear. Oh. Well, you still won't believe me, because it all sounds so improbable. But that last time, when my father saw Annette and me on Commerborne Station, it wasn't how it looked. What do you mean? Well, I never did plan to go away, anywhere. It wasn't me she was running off with. I've never had any kind of relationship with her. I've never said anything before, and I wouldn't now, except that... Except he realises that somebody did plan to go away with her then. It might be that same person who took her away this time, mightn't it? Yes. But there's more than that. Go on, Miles. Well, you see, after that, I started getting these weird letters. They were messages, cut-out letters from the newspapers. Did you never told me this? No, I know. It was very frightening. Go on. What did they say, these letters? They said things like, keep your hands off her, and other things like that. Some of them were quite obscene. But the general message was, leave Annette Beck alone and don't speak to her. And so I didn't. And I burnt them so my parents wouldn't find oh, them. Nice. And there was... There was another thing. Each one had this sign at the bottom. And it was the same as the sign found at the altar this morning. Was it indeed? <laughs> now, let's just go back. How was it you were at the station with her if you weren't involved with her at all? She had rung me and asked me to help her get away. She wanted to go to London. I knew it was wrong to help her leave like that, but she was very persuasive. And anyway, I, I did it. I she said her father would be out and she'd have her cases packed and would I fetch her and take her to the station at Commerborne? And I said yes. And she asked me to get the tickets for her so she could slip in without being noticed at the booking office. And she said it was two tickets she wanted, not one. Um, singles. And so I booked them for her, the day before she planned to leave. You were very obliging to agree to do all that? Not really. In a way, I, I didn't feel I had much choice. What do you mean? I don't know. There was something about her. You don't like to say no. It felt safer to go along with it. All right. Look, let's get right to the point. Did she never drop a hint as to who she was meeting? No. Have you any idea who he might be? No, none. You didn't see her meet anyone? No. Are you telling me you never asked who he was or looked around to see if anyone was watching him? No. I find that hard to believe. I'm sure he's telling the truth, Inspector. I am, I swear, I don't know. OK. Is there anything else? Well, you know how it ended, or, or rather you don't, not quite. I meant to have the car back in the yard before Dad missed it. And 99 days out of 100, I could have done it. But it, it just happened that he had a call from a client who was breaking a train journey for one night at the station hotel and had some bit of business he wanted to clear up quickly. And, of course, there was no car. Dad thought it had been stolen, so he reported it to the police. And then he took a taxi across to the station. And the first thing he saw was his own car parked down the station approach. And that was it. There we were with two suitcases, and I had the two tickets in my hand. Actually, he was damn decent, considering. And Annette never gave you any clue? You never noticed anything? No, nothing. All right. Well, thanks for coming in. I may want to contact you sometimes, so leave your number with the sergeant at the desk. Of course. Good night, Inspector. Good night. Oh, come along, Miles. We'll go home. I thought you'd better hear that from Miles himself. Yes, quite. The thing that links Miles and Jeff Westcott is they both knew or had been seen with Annette Beck. Miles was warned off and he took heed, but Jeff Westcott was more unreliable, less impressionable, and therefore more of a risk. What are you suggesting? That Jeff Westcott received a message like Miles? It's possible. Let's go over the facts. The one she was running off with must be from round here because of the tickets. He was going to board the train in Commerborne. It's far more likely she'd get involved with someone she saw often. Someone close to home. Mm. And these black magic signs. 
Either he's using this hogwash to lead us off the scent, or it's serious. In which case, we've got a real nutter on our hands. Was this the moment to tell George about the information Jane had gleaned from Dominic? Even if he didn't believe there was or had been a coven meeting on the Hallow Mount, he would be forced to interrogate the boys, and that would cause untold problems at the school. And what of Annette? Her role in all of this would have to be questioned. Would it make the case against her worse, especially with Jeff Westcott's death in such satanic circumstances? My imagination was running haywire. I decided I must keep focused on the facts. Facts were what George relied on, and there must be a logical answer. You know the way she reappeared? I keep thinking how odd that was. What? Well, do you remember your point about why he took the same route back and dropped her along the track behind the hallow mount? I mean, let's say all the business in Birmingham is true and she was the girl. So that Tuesday, they were coming back from this love tryst. Why didn't he drop her at a more convenient place than on the other side of the hallow mount? She'd have to climb all the way over the top. The way I see it, there must have been another reason why she was up there. Mm, well, what could she have been doing? She could have gone up there to hide something. Perhaps something neither of them wanted to risk taking home with her. Such as £2,000 worth of jewellery. And the plan was to stash it away until such time as they could go off together for good. Why wait? He had the girl, he had the money. Why not make off with them both while he had the chance? Because he was confident there was nothing in the world to connect him with the murder. So to run would have been the quickest way of inviting suspicion. Yes, it makes sense. And so they arranged for Annet to deposit it there, which meant her going that way back. Yes, and it must be a very secure hiding place. The mount was swarming with police this morning, and of course the area's been searched thoroughly for clues. Though I doubt they'll have actually overturned any solid-looking rocks. You know, I'm beginning to get a feel for this man. It's in keeping to find they play with the police like this. It's a sign of overconfidence, and that's when they make their one final mistake, and then we nab them. So, the next step is to go back there and search for this hiding place. No, that's going to be our bait. He's going to come back and get it. Surely he'll leave it for the moment. No, next Thursday, I predict. By that time, he'll be wondering if we've discovered anything and generally getting very twitchy. Yes, I'll put a watch on the hallow mount in case he goes to recover it. But watching the area during the day is not going to be so easy. It's so exposed up there and the sight of a plainclothes policeman parading about at the top would frighten him off. I know the geography department's taking a trip out that way next Thursday. And if there are about 40 boys all over the hill, it'll make dead certain nobody can hunt for anything there without being spotted. Whoever it is, we'd have to wait till nightfall. But what if we should find the stuff ourselves? What do we do? You leave it where it is, but don't let the place out of your sight. Right. I'll arrange that then. There's a phone call for you, Inspector, from CID. Right. See you later then, Tom. Life carried on as normal as it could with Annette and the virtual house arrest and a policeman living in the spare room. I learnt later from George that this was anything but a quiet week for him. Investigating the details gleaned from Jeff Westcott's death and interviewing Stockwood, the Blacklock's chauffeur, who was now number one suspect. Blacklock. Oh. oh, hello, Phelps. I'm sorry I didn't hear you. Uh, am I allowed to ask about Annette? We've been terribly anxious about her. Uh, there's nothing new. No, we're still filling in details. Uh, do you mind if I ask Stockwood a few questions? Uh, no, of course not. Actually, you could fill in the timing of the weekend for me yourself. Mrs. Blacklock went off to Gloucester on Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Now, Stockwood drove her down and brought back the car. Oh, that's right. You then gave him the whole weekend off, I understand. Uh, yes, uh, until Wednesday, in fact. Uh, I said he could have use of one of the bikes, and uh, he left about six o'clock. He came back prompt at noon on Wednesday, and then took the Bentley to Gloucester to bring Virginia back. You didn't ask him where he'd spent the time? Uh, no, I didn't. It's none of my business. It may well be your business, of course, so uh, you ask him. Which he did. But surly though he was, Stockwood provided him with an alibi that turned out to be rock solid. He'd been in jail all weekend, charged with drunken affray, which meant another dead end and the loss of another prime suspect. Well, are you satisfied, Phelps? I told you you were barking up the wrong tree. I was sure Stockwood had nothing whatever to do with it. Yes, I've finished with him for the time being. Good. 
Um, you know, Virginia and I are very worried about Annette. Uh, I know she seems deeply implicated, but we know her, you see, very well. It's impossible that she'd hurt or wrong anyone. Now, I, I know this isn't professional conduct, but I should be very grateful to you for some reassurance, a hint as to how you're thinking of her. I think of her as a human being, a whole lot more complicated and dangerous than anyone seems to realise. But if it's any consolation to you, I don't think she's a murderess. <laughs> The following Wednesday, I got a phone call. It was George proffering the olive branch. He told me the inquiry was now focusing on where Annett and her companion could have stayed over the half-term weekend. And the investigation team had narrowed the possibilities down to two old friends of Annett's. We discovered today the first one is a no-go. She lives in lodgings with three other girls and the landladies on the premises too, so we could cross that one off. The second one's more hopeful. The girl's name is Mary Clarkson and she lives in a first floor flat that's in a quiet back street in Birmingham. And if I had a nice presentable young man like you along with me, I think questioning her might be a little easier. It was the day the geography outing was to take its stand on the Hallow Mount. And as I happened to have no lessons on a Thursday, I was quite free. Mary Clarkson. Yes. I'm Detective Inspector Fels. Here's my ID, and this is Mr. Tom Fels. It's about Annette Beck. Could we come in? Oh, yes, of course. You were lucky to catch me in. I only got back this morning. Did she know you were going away for such a long visit at half term? Uh, yes, I did mention it in a letter I wrote to Annette. Did she ever confide in you about any boyfriend she had? No. Have you seen her recently? No. Not for a good six months now. Right. Well, we'll not take up any more of your time, Miss Clarkson. Thank you very much for your help. Not at all. I'm sorry I couldn't have been of more use. Um, where's the actual front door of the house? Oh, that's round the corner in the other street. This was the back door originally, before the house was divided into two flats. And this high wall, you see, enclosed what was the backyard. Has Annette ever visited you here? Oh, yes, two or three times. You never asked about coming again or suggested that she might borrow the flat when you were away? I did tell her that she could make use of it, even if I wasn't here. I told her to ask Mrs Brooks for the spare key if she needed it. And I think I mentioned it to Mrs Brooks, just in case she came. I think we'd better have a word with Mrs Brooks. Do you really think? Yes. Army dear. I was hoping you'd look in during the day sometime. Your friend was here last weekend. I gave her the key. Oh, that was all right. She thanked me so sweetly when she brought the key back on Tuesday evening. Mrs Brooks, was this the girl who came to stay? Yes, that's her. It just shows you how isolated you can be, even in a major city like Birmingham. A widow of 71 with no relations, groceries and laundry delivered, doesn't take a newspaper. I felt strangely unsettled by the realisation that she hadn't spent the five days lost inside the Hallow Mount. And just our luck to strike the only uninquisitive landlady this side of the equator. That the truth was so ordinary that she'd run away with a boyfriend. I suppose somebody in the street must have seen them. The entrance is private. A motorbike could lie there in the yard and not be seen. But as yet, no mention or glimpse of a man. Well, that's not surprising. With the old lady's windows facing the opposite way, watching TV most of the time. The fact she didn't see anyone doesn't mean much. And that's as far as we've got. Now, I've got to be on my way. Mrs Brooks promised to ring me if she remembers any more details, so keep your fingers crossed. Hello? That's you, Tom? No, sir, it's me, Duckett. Two bits of news for you. 
First we found a lad who lives three doors away from Mrs. Brooks's and plays football in the street. He kicked the ball over the wall into Mary Clarkson's yard on Friday morning and let himself in to fetch it. He says there was a motorbike propped on his stand inside there. A BSA 350. Bingo! He didn't collect registrations. Unfortunately, no. The second thing, Mrs. Brooks had an afterthought. She says there was mention of a man. Yes? She says when Anne had Beck fetched the key on Thursday, she told her she'd probably be having a visitor during the weekend. Said he had to be in Birmingham, so I'd be looking in to see her. Tell me. And she said, now this'll shake you. She said it would be her father. <laughs> So, no luck on the Hallamount as regards finding anything. So if he's going to pick up anything they did leave there, it may well be tonight. Are the boys all down now? All except Mars and Dominic. I left them there while I ran down to make this call. I'm going back to send them home so they can get some tea. Can you hold on there until I come out to meet you? Yes. Good. I'll be along as soon as I've had a look in at the Becks. Whenever you can make it, I'll be here. Did you turn up anything useful at your end? Yes. Mrs Brooks got back in touch. Remembered that Annette told her that she was expecting a visitor and apparently described him to her as her father. Does that suggest anything? It does. Well, it sounds as if we have to revise our ideas, doesn't it? I mean, why say that? Unless it was Beck. Or a man obviously respectable enough to pass for a father. A father figure. Yes. Any ideas? Uh, no. No idea. Well, give it some thought. I'll see you within the hour. I put the receiver down and felt burdened by a secret I couldn't share. The drunken confession Beck had made to me in the small hours of that morning after we had learned of the first murder. What implications did it have? If Beck was not her father, did Annette know this? When she told the landlady she was expecting her father, could she have meant the man everyone thought of as her father? Was Beck that man? Appalling as the idea was at first, I had to contemplate it. I had a strange feeling that that night was not going to be easy. Just how difficult it turned out to be, George told me later, though at the time I had no way of knowing what he'd find at Beck's house a few minutes after speaking to me. Trying to get through to you, sir. And it's gone. When? Quick! About 15 minutes ago. She can't be far. You shouldn't have let her out. I didn't. She collapsed. We were in the living room. She was laying with her head nearly in the arthur. I didn't like to move her, so I ran to get out. Where's Beck? I don't know. God! God! Go and search the house. Two six four pulling in. Q. Over. Right, Lockyer, I've called for reinforcements to join the search. Now, this is a right mess. How do you explain yourself? I told you she collapsed. How could I know it was an act? I ran for Mr Beckham when I came back and it was gone. How long was she left on her own? About ten minutes. Ten minutes? What were you doing? As I said, I was looking for Mr Beck. Where was he? I don't know. I couldn't find him. That's why it took me so long. Not hoping for promotion by any chance, are you? Right, and when you finally got back? She was gone. But why tonight? Why now? She chose her time. She had a reason. Has she had any letters, telephone messages? No, I've been with her all the time. No visitors? Well... Yes? Someone's been here? About four o'clock, the vicar called to speak to Annette, and Mr Beck was out. And I thought, well, surely she can see her own vicar. Even criminals are allowed that, and so... And so you let the vicar in. Was he left alone with her? Uh, no, I was with her all the time. Well, what did they have to say to each other? Come on! Everything you can remember. He said he hoped she was bearing up. That she must pray for strength, you know, the usual sentiment. Um, uh, he said he was to tell her that the choir had missed her at practice and sent her their prayers. He said they took comfort in the thought that they would meet her at 6.30 at the altar. What? If only in spirit, he said, and that was about all. There must be something you've missed. He didn't give her a note from someone else. No, I'd have seen. Anyway, she seemed as though she was frightened tell of Tell me it. again what he said. The choir had missed her. They sent her their prayers, and they would meet her at 6.30 at the altar, if only in spirit. 
At the auto? Oh my God! 6.30, what's the time? It's uh, 20 to 7. Come on, Locker, follow me. I know where to look. Get a move on! Where are we going? Top of the Hallow Mount. The top of the... What's she doing up there? She's gone to meet her lover or her murderer in all likelihood if we don't get there in time. Who do you mean? 264 to HQ and proceeding to the Hallow Mount. Repeat, the Hallow Mount. Reinforcements follow me there. You think it's the vicar? Hold on! The road finishes here and I'm gonna go as far as I can. Gordon, Bennett! That's it, now, quick! Tom's up there as well and on his own. Come on! So very still, not a sound. Such a peaceful place. Somehow, somehow up here it doesn't seem so strange anymore. They lived in the same house. She called him father. But they both knew there were no blood ties. Love could blossom, I suppose, like the plants on this windswept hill. They find some way of nurturing the little life they have and no one suspects. No word is spoken and the silence guards them. Ah, half past six. Come on, George, where are you? It was then, with the spell broken, that I became aware of a sound that had been hammering at my senses unnoticed for some minutes. It was coming not from the Fairford side, but from the direction of Abbot's Bale. I moved out to the edge of the slope and saw the small glowworm of a headlight weaving its way up, drawing steadily nearer until close beneath the altar it halted. The tiny light went out and a dark figure detached itself from the motorbike and began to climb the slope. Suddenly, a tiny pool of light snapped on from a pencil torch. I could see the black outline of a small briefcase, but nothing more. Then he carefully opened the case, and I saw the glint of gold in the torchlight. But instead of gold, his right hand picked out a revolver. <sighs> there was someone else coming. The figure with the torch and the gun turned round. And as he did so, in that instant, I saw and identified the murderer of both Jacob Worrell and Jeff Westcott. Oh, Peter! Oh, I thought you weren't coming. I came as soon as I could. You knew I'd come. Peter Blacklock. We've got to hurry. The bike's down below. If we can get an hour's start, we can shake them. They won't look for us westward. But you haven't even got a coat. Here, you can wear my wind jacket. Now, come on. Hurry. They'll be after us soon. And it. Don't. Don't listen to him. Don't go with him. Don't! Don't! Oh. Ah. 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 Don't go. You didn't kill anyone. Don't let him make you go. Hannah, go on ahead. No, don't! Ah. It's all right, Tom. Ah. Don't shoot! Hannah, please. Get away. It's our only chance. Get off him, Hannah. No! You shan't! Ah. I won't! Get up, and there's no time. No! You shan't touch him! I won't let you, not again! We'll let him live then. I don't care. Anything. Whatever you want. Only come. Quickly. Get up. I won't hurt him. I won't touch him. Come on. We've only got a few hours at the most. No! No! I'm not coming. Annette! There wasn't anything I wanted except you! Oh, why did you? Why did you? And now there's nothing to do except go back. Can't you see that? Annette! I'll stay with you. Don't be afraid. As long as they let me, I'll stay with you. Only go run! Oh, what have you done to yourself? You must come. I gave you the uh, ring. You uh, pledged yourself to me. Annette, uh, you can't abandon me. I'm not. I shall be with you. Always. Everywhere. But I won't go away with you. You want me, Jacob. You know I don't. You don't love me. It's because I love you. Then you've got to come uh, with me. 
You shall come with me, oh. Uh, uh, don't make me, Hannah. Uh, yes, Jack. Go on. Kill me. I want you to. Do it, Peter. I mean it. Then I'll be there, waiting for you. And you won't be alone or afraid. Do it! No! 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 She never meant to. She wasn't going to. It's all right, it's all right. She only went there to persuade him to give himself up. No, she's dead. She's dead. She's safe. She's safe. It's all right, all right. Annet! Hello, Tom. Feeling stronger? George. I've come to help stop these nightmares you've been having. Nightmares? What nightmares? I've been given permission to come and tell you what happened that night. They said they thought the truth would aid your recovery. What? The night on the Hallow Mount? You lost a lot of blood and I don't think you were conscious of all that happened, were you? No. And it's safe, Tom. She's at home with her father. But the gunshot... That was Peter Blacklock. He turned the gun on himself when he realised the game was up. Peter Blacklock, yes. I remember seeing his face in the torchlight. Of all people. It rather took me by surprise, I must admit. Of course, by committing suicide like that, we'll never know the whole truth behind the way his mind worked. But we've enough solid evidence now to close the files on the jeweller and on Jeff Westcott, too. He killed him, then? Why? He was obviously disturbed, though on the surface he appeared completely normal. We found writings in his room in the manor. It seems he was obsessed. He couldn't bear the thought of any other man being with her. So when it became known, for instance, that Miles had been at the station with her, he sent him those warning messages to really scare him off. And it worked. There was no reason for him to worry as it happened. Miles had no intention of making a play for her before or after that escapade. But Peter Blacklock didn't know that. Perhaps Annette had let drop some complimentary comment about Miles. It doesn't take much with obsessional paranoia to set it off. And the same for Jeff Westcott? Yes, except Annette had been seen with him once or twice. Peter Blacklock was obviously a very dangerous man. The obsession with her grew, and it seems she fell in love with him. But there was more to it than that. He seemed to have some power over her. What do you mean? It was as though she would do whatever he commanded. When he realised we were guarding her closely, he disguised himself as the vicar and made sure Beck was out. We think now he'd been watching the house pretty constantly, and so he managed to speak with her, though, of course, because of Lockyer's presence, it all had to be in code. But she understood, and because of that, she went ahead and carried out a plan of escape there and then. Whether he actually did practice satanic arts or just used such stories to maintain an influence over her, we'll never know. The secret's gone with him to the grave. Certainly Annette will never be the one to say. And it was Annette who hid the briefcase? Yes, she hid it, then walked over the crest and came face to face with you. But she can't have known what was in the case. He can't have told her. All she knew was he told her to hide it, and so she did. But the night after she disappeared, I thought Blacklock had rung up on that Friday night to inquire about Annette's absence. That was another part of his cunning. He divided his time very delicately. On Thursday, he took Annette to Birmingham. On Friday at dusk, he left her there and came back to choir practice and went through that little performance of inquiring after her, offering to go around and see if she was fit to have visitors. And then he went back to her and stayed with her until Sunday morning. What happened on Saturday night, you know. Whether it was planned or not is still uncertain. One thing we do know, if he was going to run away with Annette for good, he needed money. Needed money? He was rolling in it. No, the money was all his wife's. If ever he wanted anything, he had only to ask her and she bought it for him. But he had nothing. Maybe he didn't miss it, until he wanted something he couldn't ask her to buy for him. And Annette's safe? Quite safe. Don't worry any more, Tom. She'll get over it. She's a normal, healthy young girl. Just needs to grow up a bit. Well, that's enough of one visit, Tom. You're looking tired. 
I'll come back tomorrow. And he left. I lay quite still, listening to my own breathing, thinking over all he'd told me. On the surface, it was all logical, totally rational. But there was something that was not quite right. Something more. Annette Beck. There was something about her I still couldn't fathom. It's true George had dealt with the facts and found a solution that seemed to fit. But 30 years later, I've come to realize that life isn't like maths. It isn't a simple equation, because it doesn't always obey the rules. I'm here, Peter. I've come back. I said I'd never leave you. And now, we'll be together. Always. a sacred place. Did snow? Tis the doorway between heaven and earth. If ye lie here, quite still, at midnight, and look straight up into the night sky, and call three times to the spirits, they hear thee, and come down to thee. It's true. I've always known it. Thy blood was spilled in this place. You will hear, and you will come, and then you can claim my spirit for yourself, and we will live again in a new life. I'm ready. You can come now. I was lost, Peter. Lost. But now, I'm found. In Flight of a Witch by Ellis Peters, dramatised by Sally Hedges, Ewan Thomas played Tom Fels, Rob Spendlove, Detective Inspector George Fels, and Michael Tudor Barnes, Peter Blacklock. Annett and Tabitha were played by Deborah Berlin, Arthur Beck by Ian Brooker, Miles Malandine, Roger May, and Eve Malandine, Sarah Coward. Joyce Gibbs played Mrs Brooks and Tabitha's mother, Susan Jeffrey, Jane Darrell, and Dr Lloyd, James Thackeray, Godfrey and Duckett, and Richard Curnow, Dominic. Lockyer and the Priest were played by Mark Finn, Jeff, Alex Jones, and Mary Clarkson, Lisa Roche. The music was composed and played by Anthea Gomez. Flight of a Witch was directed at Pebble Mill by Sue Wilson. Next week's play is Martin Reed's rollicking comedy set in 1770. Sir Martin Makepeace devises a play, but his characters disrupt the plot and threaten the building of his folly. If I tell you it's